If you have a Bible with you, please turn to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 4. And while you're doing that, I'll just uh, join my prayers to yours. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we can meet here together this morning. Lord, as a fellowship, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. Lord, I pray that the word of God might come alive this morning, Lord, that the spirit of God might move upon this precious word. Lord, for myself, I pray that you would take this preaching, Lord, these words, that they would not be from the flesh, Lord. They would not just be from uh, the mind of a man, but rather, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would give me guidance and wisdom this morning. Lord, sometimes we're in deep need of wisdom uh, and also boldness, Lord. pray that you would help and guide me this morning, that I might do your will, Lord, in Jesus' name. Okay, we're going to have a look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. And this is what it says. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Or I guess we would say all things in common. And uh, that, that's what I want to preach on this morning uh, as part of this series that we've been doing about the New Testament church is, uh, is ATC. That's my uh, little memory peg. ATC, not the air training corps. All things common. All things common. We can see that this description of what the New Testament church is, is further supported by other verses of scripture, uh, like Acts 2, 44, which of course we looked at before, Acts 2, 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common. So what we're going to start to do is start to analyse uh, these two statements by the Apostle Luke. And, and a basic picture of the New Testament church will hopefully start to uh, start to form in your mind. So just just picking out a few phrases that we've we've read there, we might have missed them. Um, what we have is uh, is that they is that. Uh, uh, all that believe were together, all that uh, were of one heart, one soul, all that believe continually, uh, 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 daily, with one accord. Now, there's, a, there's a, a scripture that I want to go to to show you that this is not just the church in Jerusalem. This is not just the first blossoming of the church. Just go to Philippians uh, chapter one. Going to some apparent in a minute. Philippians chapter 1. And verse 27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So that's a description of the church at Philippi. So it's not just in Jerusalem, this is the, the other church, what might call the Gentile churches, that they be of one spirit and one mind. But Peter also uh, uses the same uh, the same phrases or similar phrases to Paul. Peter says to the, per the persecuted believers uh, in 1 Peter, he says, Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another 
Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. So again, one mind, compassionate, loving, pitiful, we would say sympathetic, courteous. You know, these are the things that should mark out a disciple, a believer in Christ. They should have a, there should be a solidarity about this. One mind, one spirit. Well, there should also, there's that side to it, isn't there? Where we stand up for the truth and we believe and we hold to the truth. But also, it is not without compassion. It is not without sympathy. It is not without love. And it's certainly not uh, without, without courtesy. So these are the things that mark us out as believers. That, that is a sign that the Spirit of God is at work within your heart. If you can be those things. Because these things are not produced by thinking, all right, well, I need to be like this, or I need to be like that. Young believers make that mistake, right? I've got to be more like this, I've got to try and do this. What it is, is yielding to the Holy Spirit and allowing the Spirit of God to bring and produce this fruit uh, in our lives. That's what we need as believers, is to possess this fruit, to show that the Holy Spirit of God is working within us. I'm glad to say that, that you know, yesterday we, we came down here, did a bit of cleaning around, and uh, uh, some of us did a bit of gardening, uh, some of us did too much, <laughs> and are paying for it today. But there was a, there was a spirit, a, a united spirit about us. There was a sense of people working together, helping one another. And that's what the church should be, and I'm pleased to say uh, that I see it in this church. You know, people helping one another, people um, caring about one another. That is a very precious thing to them. There's a lot of churches that don't have that in them. But I have to say this as well. As a pastor, I see it all. I make it my business to see it all. And whilst for the majority of of cases and people that I see, I, I see that picture going on, one mind, one spirit, compassionate, sympathetic and so on, that I am aware that actually there are others that are not behaving like that in the church and I've seen it and what I can only describe is actually quite harsh, rude and unchristlike behaviour. And do you know what? You know who you are. I'm not going to say any more about it than that. And, and I would urge you this morning to repent of that behaviour. You know, John talks about those that loveth not their brother do not know God, because God is love. If you can't love brothers and sisters in Christ, then you better go and check where you are in the faith. You better check where you are with the Lord. Now, I don't want to come and speak to people if necessary. So I'm telling you now, from the platform, we don't want that here. It might be okay in other churches. You might be able to do that, but I don't want it here. I want to maintain that unity of the Spirit, that bond of peace. And if that's you, you need to repent. You need to get right with God because I believe it grieves the Spirit of God. We don't want that. We want people to love one another and to help one another, not be a stumbling block to them. In the early church, we have this phrase, all things common. And it's expressed clearly, I believe, here and practically. Let's have a closer look at it, Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, Acts 2, 44, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. We'll look at the other one in a minute. So, Acts 2, 44, And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. So, 
They, 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 they didn't say, well, this is mine. I, I can't give this away to somebody. No, I bought this with my money. There's none of that possessiveness about the things of the world. But they looked, they were looking to see who has need, who needs something that I've got, and I'm going to supply that, that need. Acts 4, 32 and 34 says this, Neither was any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Now, was this, was this mandatory? Was there some guy at the top, was there an apostle saying, right, you've got to do this and you've got to, you've got to sell all this stuff and then you've got to give it to these people here? No. That's the amazing thing about it is that is not how this worked. There are many churches, to, not many, but there are some churches trying to replicate this by, by, by saying you've got to sell everything, you've got to give it to the poor. That's not how the New Testament church worked. That's what's so amazing about this, I think. Let me, let me clarify that a little bit for you. In Acts chapter 5, we read about two people, Ananias and Sapphira. And you may remember that they, they sold the possession of some land, probably because they saw Barnabas doing the same, and they thought, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do the same. And they sold some land, and they brought the money to the apostles. But they kept some of it back. And uh, Peter questions them, or certainly questions Sapphira about this, it, and says basically, is this the full amount that you sold the land for? And she, she says, yes it is. Uh, what we find out is she lied. What they done is they sold the land, and then they kept back some for themselves, and they brought the rest of the money to the apostles and said, this is all the money. This is everything we've got for the land. Here, here, here you are. And she is rebuked. Peter says, and it's a very important way to catch this, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after that it was sold, was it not in thine own power? In other words, it was your land. You could have done with it as you were. You didn't have to sell it. And, and when it was sold, the money was yours. But what you've done is actually you've lied. You've lied to the apostles. You've lied to the fellowship. You've actually, he says, you've lied. It's, it's not those people you're lying to. It's actually God. It's the Holy Spirit you're lying to. That's why it's so serious. And we read in this account that both Ananias and Sapphira are struck dead. They're killed by God. <coughs> so it's a very... Uh, serious thing. But what's important for me here, and I want to bring out, is this this land, this money, is not being confiscated from people. Uh, it is being given freely, without coercion. Uh, the people want to give it. Uh, uh, I wonder why in the West we find this so hard. The, this idea, why it amazes us so much, is because. Probably we wouldn't do that. It's not something we're familiar with hearing people doing, selling their house and they're coming and giving the money to the church. We're not familiar with that. Uh, we're not familiar with that in our, in our culture. Many people in the West find it hard. Do we, in this church, find it hard? Would it, would it be something we think, I don't think I could ever do that. I wonder why that is. Have you ever stopped to think, why did they do it so freely? And if I think about it, if I think about selling land or my house or something, I get all this money and just giving it to whoever I need. Why do I, why do I find that difficult? I believe it's to do with values. What we value. Remember we did it a couple of weeks ago that uh, uh, we accommodate what we prioritize, right? Whatever is a, a priority to us, we're going to move things around and give that accommodation. Uh, uh, yeah, if I think this is important, everything else goes down the list. This comes to the top of the list. It's a question of values. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but our values come from a variety of different sources. There are what are known as inherited Values. These are things that we, we maybe they've been passed down from your parents, certain values, 
or could be from, from siblings, could be from teachers when you, you've got, gone to school, uh, could be from your peer group, etc. Now, some of these values may be good values or good moral values, but some of them may not be. But they become part of our value system. When we, when we become an adult, we're carrying those with us. Uh, because if, if when you're a child, you're very impressionable, and so these things we carry with us, hence the importance of Christian parents teaching their children about what is valuable and what is not. There are also what we call compensatory values. I'll give you an example, that's the easiest way to explain it. So, say uh, as a child, you had a very deprived childhood, where you didn't have uh, uh, many things, uh, when you become a parent, maybe you, you will overcompensate for that and, and you'll, you'll want to give your children lots of things. Or another example would be uh, somebody who never had an opportunity to go into further or higher education, just went straight into work, but when they become a parent, they decide they're going to send their children through college and uh, university uh, and get you know, a, a degree and so on. Can you see how that works? People do that. They overcompensate for something that they feel was lacking uh, in their own childhood. So they become our values as well, right? Uh, uh, we adopt those also as our values. And then there are what we call intrinsic values. These are sort of habits of thought uh, uh, that may even come from our, something in our unconscious mind, just particular ways we think about things, particular ways we do things. Uh, and, and, and maybe you see this in yourself. You know, it's often it's when you do something stupid and you look back and think, now why did I not learn my lesson last time I did this? <laughs> I've already done this. Like uh, weeks ago I did this. Why have I not learned my lesson? Because there are certain patterns of thought that, that, that entrench themselves in our minds and sometimes you've got to dig a bit deeper to find out why am I, hang on, why am I doing this? Now no, this is not psychology class this morning but this is how the human mind works and it's useful as Christians just to be aware of that. You know this is, this is how we, when, when we were clearing the garden at the front there I thought I'll, I'll just whack down these, uh, these nettles and these weeds and uh, I don't look nice, really nice, I just chop them all down and then underneath there was all this rubbish, all this stuff there. I had to clear all that out as well. And so what you find as a Christian, when you start altering your value system, yeah, don't, yeah I don't believe in this anymore, yeah, well, that's on two rocks, and I'm studying the Bible. What you find is when you move that stuff out of the way, there's all this rubbish underneath, there's all these accumulating values that sometimes people don't even get past that. You know, but I encourage you this morning to look at yourself, to look what's within your own motivation. The Bible talks about how the Lord looks on the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Why am I doing these things? Why am I being like this? What is it that lies underneath it all? So these patterns of thought may give rise to values and, and, and in an almost a subconscious way we start to give attention to what we think is important and dismiss that that we think is not important. And you may even be dismissing what I'm saying now because you think well, that's not important. But I ask you this morning to think about what I'm saying, what I'm preaching this morning. The mind or the heart strongly affects the faculties of a person. Change the way that your mind thinks and you may change the person. The scripture says, for as he thinketh in his heart, so he is. Proverbs 20, 23 verse 7. I love that verse because it says so much. It means that it may appear to be a certain way on the outside. We put up this front, uh, 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 this what I call the Sunday face. Hello brother. Uh, but, but hang on, God is saying that is not actually how you are. How you are is how you are in here, in your heart, in your mind. What's going on here? It's no good just changing. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do this, I don't do that. Great, but what about in here? How are you in your heart? How are you in your mind? You know, it has been, it's been often said, find the person at home. What are they like at home? 
Ooh, <laughs> that's difficult, isn't it? Even for pastors. How are you at home? Not how are you when, when brethren are gathered together, but how are you when your guard is down? And that often becomes that that is the real you. And that's what the scripture is saying. What you are in your heart, in your mind, that is what you are. That's, and that's why that is the thing that needs to change, isn't it? That's the thing that we need to change. Why was the early New Testament church giving away this land? Why were they, why were they giving it to everybody who had need? Because God had changed their heart. Not because someone was telling them to do it, not because it was the rules of the church you had to do that, but because the Spirit of God had changed their heart. They were now new creatures in Christ. That the power of the Holy Spirit was so, so amazing, so uh, transforming, that actually it changed their heart and, and the result of that was these things no longer had any value for them. Money, houses, possessions. Jesus says that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. They learnt that. Even though they were young, comparatively young Christians, they're giving this stuff away because that is their heart. Their heart has truly been changed. For us in the West, we've got to get rid of a lot of baggage, a lot of consumerism, a lot of years of being taught all this stuff. This is important. We've got to keep it. No, let God change your heart. You've got to be ready uh, to accept that if you want to grow as a Christian. It is time to rethink everything. It really is. It's time to bring all our value system, all of the, everything that we thought, and lay it at the foot of the cross and say, God, teach me. Teach me. One of the difficult things, I think, for Christian believers in the West is relinquishing our personal rights relinquishing a reliance upon things, possessions, money. The proverb says that, you know, money is a shelter. That's a, to some people it's like a shelter, it's like a, it's a net that's going to break your fall. It's a shelter as wisdom is a shelter. Well, the difference with wisdom is it's going gonna, it's gonna to preserve your soul, the wisdom of God. So don't look to money as a shelter, look to godly wisdom as your shelter. My dad always used to say, Paul, stay away from churches. You can see, I didn't, <laughs> didn't listen to that advice. Stay away from churches. All they want is your... Can, can anyone finish it off for me? All they want is your money. money. They want your money. That's all they want. And, uh, well, I'll tell you this. Somebody came here, they're not here today, but somebody once came here and privately had a word with somebody. Everything gets back to me eventually. Uh, probably had a word with somebody and was laughing and said, oh, this, this particular lady said, well, it's all right for Paul. He's probably on his way to his first BMW. Um, let me say this, I don't know what it's like in, in America, uh, I guess you can make a lot of money there, but if you have a desire to be a minister of God, a servant of God, don't do it for money, because, because and, and by the way, I have no problem, if you want to come and see me and ask me what I earn from Stockport Evangelical Church, I'd be quite happy to tell you, but you, you, I would advise you not to, you'd probably be embarrassed if I told you what I earn. Uh, there's more. There's more of bus ticket than BMW about me. I'm afraid uh, we're not making. We're not raking it in. And any minister that becomes a minister to make money has abandoned his principles straight away. Didn't the Apostle Paul say that if if I was looking for the praise of men, I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. If you're looking for men to support you uh, and to favour you, don't be. A faithful minister of God because you're looking at narrow is the way few are those who are going to listen to that message 
of the gospel. It's a lonely road for those who want to truly follow God. And if you want to be serious this morning about the Word of God and about prayer and about being disciple, if you want to be serious about following the Lord and sharing the gospel with your friends, don't think for one minute the devil is going to say, oh, okay, yeah, you got me. You know, those pesky Christians, they've done it again. They've chosen the better way. He is going to be right in your face. Every infernal, malevolent, diabolical scheme and strategy that he can pull out of the air, out of the bag, that's what he's going to use against you. He doesn't care. He's not a gentleman. Whatever it is that pushes your buttons and that drives you mad, that's what he's going to use. That is what he's going to use against you. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I thank God that we have the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I will build my church. He says he's going to build it upon this rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You need to remember that this morning. You're sat in a small church this morning. I'll tell you this, it is God's church. It is Christ's church. It is built on the principles of the doctrines of the apostles and upon the blood of Jesus Christ. It is cross-centered, Christ-centered. It is gospel preaching, Bible teaching. And that is what stops Satan prevailing against it, is the fact that it is Christ's church done in his way. You could have a massive collection of people here this morning. We could do that. You know, if, if we just dropped a few of the doctrines, if we just stopped being real for a moment, if we just stopped preaching it how it is, if we just stopped talking about holiness and the gospel and sin and the need to repent, we could have a bigger church. But it wouldn't be Christ's church. Because that's what he came to teach. That's what he came to preach. And whilst I got breath in my body, that is what I'm going to preach at this church. It's time to rethink everything. It's time to say, what do I really want? Submission to the Word of God? Submission to the Spirit of God? That may mean the overturning of many of your values. It may mean the, the violating of some of those values that you hold dear. It may mean re-prioritizing your life. It may involve some radical rethinking. In fact, if this church is to have ATC, all things common, it is time to start rethinking everything to bring every thought captive in obedience to Christ. I'm just struck by the words of David in the Psalms. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Psalm 86 verse 11. Teach me thy way. Are you teachable? This morning, are you ready for the Holy Spirit to teach you? And to lay aside those values, lay aside the, the ways, even the patterns in which you used to think. And allow God, allow the Spirit of God to show you a new and a better way of believing and living. That we also might be that New Testament church. I got a vision this morning for a New Testament church here. In Stockport. I have a vision and I, I, want, I want you to get hold of that vision that what, come what may against us discouragements difficulties I had a brother saying to me it, it's so hard there's all these discouragements there's all these difficulties no one's supporting me I said welcome to spiritual warfare that's what it means to be a, a real Christian, to be doing the will of God. 
Strange things will start to happen, yes. Why? Because you are entering spiritual warfare. You are bringing the light of Christ against the darkness. You are holding up the standard. When the spirit of, what is it? Someone give it me. Um, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, that's it. The spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. We are a standard. If we hold to Christ, if we deal with those things I said before that are wrong, that are grieving the Spirit of God, we get right with God and we love one another, we show sympathy, compassion, kindness, we will be that standard. Christ in our midst, we will be that church that says, here is Christ, here is the gospel, here is the way of salvation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for your word and pray, Lord, that you would bless our time together uh, this morning. In Jesus' name.